Oh God, in a host of, of things that occupy our life, uh, some of those this morning we're, we've talked about that have to do with uh, this particular building and our life together as a community of, of faith. And so we are mindful of those, and uh, we, we do pray for uh, guidance, sensitivity, discernment, um, even something that we talk about in the form of a renovation or building a new building. Uh, we, we know that's not as important as that is. That's not what's most important. What's most important is that they are used and leveraged in such a way that ends up uh, changing lives. And so that's what we're about, and that's what we, we ultimately uh, want to be obedient to. It's how your spirit leads us in a way that your gospel uh, comes and breaks into our time and space in such a way that leads to, to what you call redemption, salvation, sanctification, wholeness. And so we continually pray for this inside of our own lives, inside of, of this place here, but not just here, every place. Every place that bears the name of Christ and, and really for those that don't, uh, that we would be witnesses. Um, what your New Testament and your Old Testament describes is that people who follow you uh, bear uh, your, your nature, uh, your image in such a way that uh, points to who you are and what you are about. At the same time, as we gather, uh, there are things, burdens, people, situations that are outside of this place that um, are, are a concern of ours and as an act of faith uh, and as an act of obedience because you invite us to do this, you actually command us to do this. We uh, share those with you this morning. Uh, some we will write down on a pad, and yet there are some that we carry that are, that are so sacred to us that um, even giving voice to it is difficult. And so, thankfully, we trust your spirit to guide us and direct us. And what we'll discover in this chapter is that your spirit even intercedes uh, on our behalf. And so for that, um, not just that we're grateful, oh God, we're, we're humbled and awe that uh, you share yourself with us in, in this fashion. So all of this we commit to you again. In our time of study this morning, what we pray for is a reflective style of study which is twofold. One is to learn about the text, uh, but at the same time that the text would be leveraged inside of us uh, so that our nature moves closer to you, so that our nature and the nature of Christ um, become one. And so we pray for this, and we pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. All righty, so we are in Romans uh, chapter 11, right? Is it 11? Okay, just want to make sure. Just want to make sure y'all are on, on the right page. It's Romans chapter 8. We, uh, um, you know, incidentally, I've been up for a long time with lots of coffee, so that probably explains a little bit of the, uh, all over the place. Um, so we're in Romans chapter 8. Last week, we looked at the first four verses of chapter 8. And not that we're going to go back and recap everything. Chapter 8 is inside of, now keep in mind, the book of Romans, uh, what Romans is, is Paul's conversation um, with the church in Rome, house churches inside that, that large area, and he's creating, or he's, he wants to move them into a different behavior. That's what he hopes to establish, or hopes to accomplish. He does that by uh, a series of arguments. And uh, the first, uh, you know, three quarters, uh, there's 12 arguments. So uh, I think nine of them are theological in nature. And that's chapters 1, verse 18 through chapter 11. When he gets to chapter 12, the arguments then become uh, around behavior or practice or functioning. That's my term. Uh, but so we're, we're in this theological section of the book of Rome. And chapter 8 
is a conclusion to a major argument that has multiple points or, or fingers that are uh, assigned to it um, that start in chapter 5. All right? He starts talking about Abraham as the, the poster person for faith. Abraham is justified by faith, not because he was circumcised. Circumcision and action is something that comes after he believed. And so Paul makes the jump that it also takes place in the, in the life of, of people who come after Abraham. Well, that raises the question of what about people who were before Abraham? Uh, so he goes back into another argument or to a, a, you know, another finger of this major argument that has to do with Adam. And uh, with Adam, we have the uh, entrance or the introduction of sin. So he addresses the sin issue. Uh, and that Jesus is the new Adam. Um, if sin entered in through the old Adam, then in the new Adam we have righteousness or justification via faith. Um, and so for seven, part of six and part of seven is this whole conversation around what does Jesus do in death and resurrection and how does that address and deal with and handle the whole sin issue because the law could not. And so he addresses that uh, in the person of Christ. When we get to chapter 8, we get the conclusion of all of that. All right, so this is the last little, this is the hallelujah chorus of the first part of the Messiah piece that many of you uh, witnessed back in December. Everything's leading up to something. This is what it's leading up to. And what it's leading up to in verses 1 through 4, what we discover is that now there is this dawn or is this life in the Spirit. And this life that's in the Spirit, uh, what that equates to is no condemnation. Uh, it also, there's, there's four different parts or, or, or four uh, uh, ways that uh, Paul describes this life in the Spirit and, and what that really means uh, for the person, and, and that is that there's no condemnation. At the same time, it's that uh, people have been set free from sin, uh, that the law has been dealt with. Actually, sin itself uh, has been dealt with. Uh, all that is in the first four chapters, and it's describing what exists now for the believer. Now, it's, a, it's, talk, it's a judicial language, uh, which means that the inside parts of the person might not fully be, uh, uh, there still might be personal issues or sins or what have you that the person uh, himself or herself uh, is addressing and dealing with while living in the life of the Spirit. But on, on this big issue of what now sits with the person, it's they're, they're on the side now of the Spirit. And with that is... No condemnation, set free. Whatever that was required uh, for fulfillment, that has been fulfilled because of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and the person receives that gift through faith. So that sets it up. That's sort of a recap for what we've, we looked at last, last week. And now we want to jump back in to, uh, to, to chapter 8. Just as a, a, a refreshing, if somebody would read verses 1 through 8. We're going to go back and read 1 through 4 just to hear it again. And then we're going to look at 5 through 8. All right. All right, stop right there for just a second. I just want to touch on something. All right, verse 1, therefore. I think uh, some verses say there is, therefore. Some just say therefore. All right, so that's the conclusion part. All that he's been leading up to, to verse 8, when we get to therefore, th this is the effects of or, or the, uh, what does that mean for us 
uh, verses, you know, chapter 1, 18 through all of chapter 7. This therefore marks a, a change in, in uh, discussion. Then we get verse 2, verse 3. We're also going to get in verse 5. You notice that those verses begin with what, what word? For. So he is substantiating. He's, he's, he's proofing what the therefore says. The, 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 what does chapter 1 through 7 mean? What does it equate? Well, it equates that there's no condemnation. Well, how, why is there no condemnation? Well, there you have your reasons. Four, four, four. All right, so I just wanted to point that out. All right, so if you'll, you'll pick up in verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the, that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to, those, to God's law, uh, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature all right, thank you. So what we, what we have in, in, in verses 5 through 8 is uh, Paul is continuing this argument about um, what does it mean to have no condemnation or, or how or why is that a possibility. And part of what we discover here is that there really are uh, two, two ways, two avenues two realities, uh, you can sort of play around with those terms. One is, is governed or ruled by the flesh. The other one is govern, governed and, and ruled uh, by the spirit. And with that, there's a, there's a way of thinking. Uh, obviously, there's a type of lifestyle that is a part of this. Uh, and they lead to different outcomes. So they have different destinations. Um, obviously, the, what's ruled by the flesh ends in death. And what's ruled by the Spirit ends in life. And I mean, this is what Paul's, what, what Paul's talking about in verses 5, 6, 7. Um, the, one, the flesh cannot please God. That's verse 7 and 8. Uh, and that state of a person is defined by hostility. It's defined by rebellion towards God. And, and it's incapable of obtaining some level of divine or God's approval, because it's governed by something that that is is stands in contrast to who God is and what God does. And so these two are juxtaposed uh, in chapter eight. Flesh has its own way of life, leading to a certain area. Uh, spirit has its own way of life; it's leading to a certain area, which is not unlike what you find in the book of Revelation. All right, another one of y'all's favorite books, right? You know, just like the problem of pain. Same, same with the book of Revelation. Um, you might remember when John and I uh, taught on the book of Revelation a number of years ago. Um, and by the way, everything that we do is archived. So if you want to go back and look at something, not just in here, but if you wake up loving the problem of pain, again, your favorite book, and you want to go and revisit all those lessons, just go online. They're all archived. Even the book of Revelation that we did on a Sunday morning is archived. What we discover with the book of Revelation is that Revelation describes uh, what it, these, these, these realities. Those that live according to the flesh. Now, it doesn't say flesh and death. It says uh, fallen Babylon, Antichrist, you know, and all, all, that, all that shows in the book of Revelation as compared to uh, kingdom of God. Christ is head, but it's the same, these two things are juxtaposed. So Paul's not the only writer who writes this way. And he's not the only one who is talking uh, about the reality that now sits under God and the reality that doesn't sit under God um, that, that are coexisting. Now, not necessarily coexisting together, but they, they, they do exist. There's a state of people who live with flesh as, uh, you know, Paul's language here, Flesh as their Lord, governor, what have you. And there's, there's also a, another reality that is, sits under God um, that, that operates now according to the Spirit. Um, what Paul is getting at here in these verses, now it's, it's important to note, he, uh, it's not so much to warn 
Christians or believers uh, about the, the difficulties or, or the struggles or perils of, of walking or living or thinking uh, as if to say, well, you know, I, I know I'm a, I'm a Christian, but I still got some flesh that I'm working out on. He's not, he's not talking about personal sanctification here. Now, he's going to talk about that. that come, that's, going to, that's going to happen. Um, but it's just not in this particular segment uh, of chapter 8. He, he's talking about it in, as cosmic realities or, or large, large uh, sections or categories of people. There are people who, who, are, who operate according to the flesh uh, fully as compared to people who are, who, who are now under the Spirit. Uh, but he's, he's not, uh, often what we do is we read chapter 8 and we want to apply it to my own personal life and to what levels am I, am I holy as in holy living, what levels of obedience as compared to, to levels of, of disobedience inside the life of a person. That's not what he's getting at here. Again, he's still on these large, large cosmic uh, type categories uh, for people. He's talking about the states, uh, not, you know, the state of a person, either in the flesh or either in the spirit, uh, not the inward struggle that a person might have in living out the Christian life. So see this passage. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's not that our hearts are in a perpetual state of civil war with God. Instead, what Paul is getting at is that imagine that your heart... That's a pretty good drawing, isn't it? Imagine that your heart has this fortress around it and that there, you know, there are forces that want to destroy the heart. And that's the, 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 that the whole reality that exists, uh, as what Paul says, uh, under flesh, uh, compared to uh, another force that wants to, uh, that wants to create life inside the heart. Does that make sense? All right, hopefully it does. Um, if not, just give me a wink or whatever, you know. And so, uh, or, or cough, you know, right, <coughs> you know, so. Um, so this is what Paul's getting at inside here. Because he's describing people who are under the Spirit, well, there's no condemnation. So if there's no condemnation, why, why would he then talk about that people, you know, why would he then say, okay, well then, people who have no condemnation now are under the flesh. That's why he's seeing these, these major topics here, these major states of, of people, um, uh, which is, should be comforting. Uh, the idea that, um, you know, Paul is, is given rationale for why there is no condemnation. Well, the reason why there's no condemnation is because the Spirit is at work. And, and the, what Jesus has done is, has destroyed the flesh, uh, um, as in large, large, large flesh, not inside flesh. All right. Slade, do you have a hand? I got no, I right. a hand. Okay. I mean, our question, I'm sorry. Uh, not a hand. I know you got a hand. You got two. Right? Yeah, so, you know. Uh, so, uh, anyway, I, out of my peripheral vision, I thought I saw you raising your hand. All right. So, uh, let, let's keep going. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. You know, uh, you know, on my way in today, I uh, I was listening to a report. Uh, obviously, Valentine's is coming, and there was I was one of my channels I listened to on the way in is a financial channel, and they were talking about all the industry that's tied to you know the whole Valentine since it's right around the corner, and, and they were interviewing this guy and how that sort of developed into this you know billions and billions of dollars. Uh, What's that? It, it did. So it's in my subconscious now, you know. So, uh, um, you know, so I also made a note on the way to the end that said, don't forget Valentine's, you know. So, I mean, uh, so, yeah. All right. So that's not in the text. So anyways. All right. So uh, verse 9. Um, let's, if someone would read uh, verses 9 uh, through 11. Yet 
the spirit is the life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who lives in you. All right, so that, there's a couple things that's really important about this that sort of, hopefully, if, if anything was confusing about the five through eight, it'll get cleared up, c- cleared up here. Um, notice that he switches from third person to what? Second person. Because he's talking about the, the church, and, uh, or more specifically, the Roman church. And what is he talking, or what is he reminding the Roman church of where they are. Right, they are over here. All right, so I mean, five through eight is a little bit of commentary about one through four. But when he gets to chapter nine, he goes back and talks about them specifically, about what it's like to be in a state of no condemnation. Well, why? Well, the reason why is because they are in the Spirit. Uh, but you uh, are not in the flesh. Uh, you are in the Spirit. I mean, that, um, th- this is a restatement. Um, one of the ways, you know, they don't, and y'all have heard me say this, in, in, in both Hebrew and Greek, there's no way to, to bold, italics, highlight, or anything like what we would do in, in, in levels of, or all caps, you ever send a text, or a message of all caps. Uh, and uh, so the only way they could do that is they could either say something in with emphatic language, in, in ver- a verb tense that way, or to restate it. And you can restate it by saying the same thing uh, over and over and over. Or you could say the negative and then the positive, or the positive and then the negative. And so you see that here. You're not in the flesh. Well, how would, you, how would you pound the table on that? You could either say you're not in the flesh again, or you could say you're in the Spirit. And so Paul is two times saying to the church in Rome, this is not you. And the reason why, we've talked about that from chapter 1, 8, 1 verse 18, all the way to the end of chapter 7, and, and you're, you're over here, you're over here under the Spirit, this is where this is you, and the reason why is because of what who Christ is, what Christ has done, and how that gets applied to the life of the believer uh, because of faith. Um, so this idea of switching from third person to second person, uh, don't miss that. Um, I mean that's that's really really important because the Spirit indwells inside of of you, inside of the person, and if the Spirit's there then Christ is there. What's interesting here is that there's, there's sort of this dual process that takes place inside of chapter 8, and, and that is one that lives in this reality, they, they possess the Spirit. At the same time, the Spirit possesses them. It's that whole grafting concept that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, that it's not just, uh, there, there's this, well, Paul, I mean, the best verse on this is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All right, so when you're in Christ, what? The old passes away. Everything has become new. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we actually say uh, in, in translation, new creation, um, and that's probably not a really good translation. The, the, uh, they didn't really have a word like entity, uh, or, or creature, but the idea is that it's a new entity, a new creature, or a new creature is created that has both the person and Christ together. That they're they're bounded, they're they're held. Where where you, it's not just that. Well, you know, this side is Christ and this side is Shane. It's all mixed together to where you can't dissect it anymore. You can't separate it. You're you're together in Christ. All right, so that's that's what Paul is. Uh, this is this is Romans version of Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen, uh, and and so this is where you're at. And if you're over there, then it's life, as compared to a state that leads uh, to death. I mean that all that is because there's no condemnation. Again, he's fleshing out. That's 
wrong word there, wasn't it? Uh, he's describing what it's like to be in the spirit. And flesh has nothing to do with it. Yeah, so that's the wrong word. Pardon the pun. All right, so any, any, any questions, uh, uh, queries, worries, anything that's confusing, so far, confusing as we're working through uh, Romans chapter 8? All right, well, let's keep going. Wow, it's like a record. I'm on it today. All right, 12 through, uh, let's go 12 uh, through 17. Or no, 12 and 13. Let's stop at 13. Let's just do 12 and 13. Anybody? All right, so now we get into how that plays out in the life of a person. Now, five through eight, you know, he's talking about states. And then uh, nine through 11, still talking about states. Uh, but when we, get into, uh, when we get into chapter 12, um, we begin with what word? Therefore. Right, so which means now a conclusion. Um, or what's the effects of? Well, if we live in the spirit... The logical conclusion then is that the spirit indwells inside the person and that the, you know, there's, that, there's that bonding, there's that, that grafting of both the spirit and the person. So the conclusion is that we then live according to this and not according to that. Uh, I mean, and, and there's rationale behind this. Sin by nature, and we talked a little bit about this last week, is so deadly and so destructive that um, it's not something that merely is to be contained as if to say, you know, uh, here's sin, and what we're going to do is just put a little box around it, and, you know, we'll, we'll sort of contain it like fencing in something in your backyard. Uh, to Paul, and I think that we would agree to this, uh, and it's not just in the book of Romans. It shows up in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Sin is so destructive that it's not something that's to be contained. It's something to be destroyed. Which brings us to the cross and the resurrection. Uh, it's it's uh, for theologically speaking, and this is he's still on the theology side of the argument, but I think that we would, all of us have seen the effects of sin inside of our own life, inside of just, other people, family, uh, just watching things in inside the world. Um, this is not something to, to sort of treat lightly, as if to say, you know, just stick it in the backyard. And if you're in the backyard and you put your fence up, nobody can see it, right? And uh, no, it's, it's something that has to be rooted out um, inside of the person. Uh, and, we, and when we move into... Uh, verse 18 of chapter 8, you see it on a cosmic level because the language changes from not just personal, uh, which is where it is right now. It's going to go to this cosmic groaning and awaiting and that, it, that the, uh, not just for the person but for the entire cosmos groans for this to be not just destroyed but fully evicted uh, from reality. Um, so here Paul is, is addressing that, uh, that sin is, is, because sin is so deadly and so destructive, it's not something to be treated lightly uh, as if to be contained, but it needs to be destroyed completely. Uh, another, and, and, that, uh, and that's something that the Spirit does. So the reason why this ends, the road of the Spirit ends in life, is because the work of the Spirit takes what took place on the cross and in the resurrection and, and applies it to the person, applies it to creation, and the effects of that is that sin is destroyed and eventually will be. There's this now and not yet type, type uh, process or reality to salvation. We are saved and yet we will be saved at the same time. Instantaneous justification process, sanctification, but both of them end in the same way. Sin will be destroyed. 
Sin has been destroyed cosmically, and then personally it gets destroyed through the living out of that inside the person. Now, that should be incredibly hopeful, because not in this class. There's another Bible study that meets over here, so we're talking about that one. They have all kinds of struggles. We do not, all right? So for them, we're hopeful. Let's take a picture of this. Hey, we'll send it over, patch it into them, you know? Uh, you know there's hope for y'all, you know? Uh, um, the work of the Spirit not just changes our relationship with God, that instantaneous justification, legal, judicial, but it also will lead to a life of holiness that played out all the way uh, ends in wholeness, either this side or the next. So if you're worried about the, it is, I'm, this has been a, one of the ahas over the last two years of my just study and ministry and reflection is it's been my experience that in just observing people, the struggles that we have are normally with the same thing. What, what I mean by that is that it's not like we commit the whole gambit of sins. All right, we might commit one sin or two sins all the time. All right, that's that's sort of you know if I'm writing a paper, one of the adjustments of of, the, of learning is that human nature really doesn't struggle with everything, and it could be different for each person. Okay, so if if it's sin A for Shane, then it might be sin B for for Becky, and then sin C for Ruth, or, or what you know. It's, it's the same struggle for a while. All right, so that's, that's one of my, uh, that's a hypothesis that I've developed over the last few years. Now, you can kind of shake your head or shake your head no if I'm just off and need to start over and go back to the drawing board. But, but I, that's been my experience of just observation, just in human nature in general, my own life, inside the life of, of other people, is when we talk about sin, it's not all of it. It just seems to be one thing that we continually do. All right, am I close? All right, so that's okay. All right, so the hypothesis, you have to go back to the scientific message. You know, yeah, I'm seeing a little bit. I have to test it some more, and then we'll come and make it a theory. Um, but over the last few years, that's been one of my little journal notes just in, in observations is that, you know, God, our struggle is not with that we commit all the sins that are possible our struggle seems to be the same sin over and over and over for a season of time. So the good news that if that is the case, the work of the Spirit, even if it is slow, not because the Spirit's fault, but for our fault, it will eventually lead to life. Which means everything, to use Southern language, everything will get fixed either this side or the next. Now that's not an excuse not to continue working in the Spirit because this is emphatic language, what we get here. Because you now live here, because this is where you live, well, the conclusion of that is you, you let the Spirit work its lordship in your life. But until that fully gets played out into every little aspect, if you can imagine, if you ever, if you ever spilt like a glass of water or, or something, and it just seems to run forever. Wherever there's a crack, guess what? That's where the water's going. So, and one of the, you know, one of the images for the Holy Spirit is what? Water. So until that water is spilled completely into every crack of your life, and so there's a process to that, eventually it will. And it will lead to life, uh, the now part of life, and the not yet part of life. Well, for me, I think that's, that takes a big load off my back. So just about shame, all right? Nothing, nothing, you know, y'all, you know, I got my own burdens, you know, right? So I mean, we all got our own, you know? So, but when I think about my own personal holiness, um, there's some comfort uh, I think the way we talked about it last week is, and this was not, I am going to bring up the national championship game, 
not to rub it in on anybody, but it's a perfect example. Now that we know that the national championship game is, is been played, if we were to watch it again, it would be impossible for us to watch it uh, as if it hasn't happened, right? So, I mean, if, you know, it, uh, same thing here. We know how this is going to end. It's going to end in life. So we now approach the living out of our life here knowing that it's going to end to life, capital L. Cosmic concept. A life with God. Well, if you, if you have that level, I mean, that's assurance. Okay, that's what we're getting at here. The theological theme of assurance. And, and people ask me, how do I know? Well, how do you know? Well, it's because there's no condemnation. And either it's real or it's not, all right? I mean, it, you know, and, and if, but if there's any aspect of this that's real, then why wouldn't all aspects of it be real? Does that make sense? And so if, it, if, if, if there is a God who manifests himself in Jesus Christ, and there was a death and a resurrection, which means then that that means God conquers death, which is the result of this, and then there's a, a presence of God that takes what God conquered and did and applies it to the life of the person, then the natural following of that is it's going to lead to life. Big capital L. And so that, that should take some of the, uh, some of the pressure off. I, I think actually what it does is free people up to want to live with God and to allow the work of the Spirit to have its natural conclusion. If you know that you're loved that much, we'll use the language of love. And so uh, learning to live with that level of trust will take time, but you already know how it's going to end. That's, that's different. Well, that's what Paul is describing here. You're over here, all right? Which means you, you, you live in the realm of the Spirit. And eventually the work of the Spirit has already taken care of the big issue. Is there going to be death or life? Well, there's going to be life. All right, so you can take off the, 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 the number one anxiety. Death or life? Well, there's life. All right, if that's the case, it's going to have its full effect. Now and not yet. That's what he's getting at. Therefore, what's the conclusion of it all? Well, we're under the Spirit. So we're going to live this way. God's, already, God's going to work it out. He's already have on the big things. We're going to, you know, that, that water is going to spill into every crack of, of our life. And, and while that water is, is, being, you know, is running out over the table, it's eventually going to find its way into every crack of our life. And the work of the Spirit will bring about life. On the big, on the big L and the little L. That's the work of God inside the life of the person. All right? That's also a perfect time to take a break. All right, so. All right let's take about 10, 10 minutes or so. Is it, is it hot in here? Oh, good. Thank you.
righty, we'll uh, come back together and um, so let's do this. Let's uh, turn to Colossians chapter three. A good parallel chapter uh, in another book or another letter um, to Romans chapter eight, particularly the, the part that we were uh, that we've looked at, is Colossians chapter three, and uh, and so you can see the same line of thought, uh, different language, but obviously the same same thought pattern. Um, chapter three begins uh, this way. So if you have been raised with Christ, notice the past tense language. So he's talking about this idea of, of being, you know, you're, you're, you're in the realm, uh, realm's my language, okay, but you're in, in the realm of the Spirit. You're on that side of the, of the ledger. If you have been raised with Christ, uh, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Paul in Romans 8 uses the spirit flesh language. Here in, in, to, in Colossians, uh, Paul is using the heaven, earth, above, below uh, language. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died... Notice Romans 6, remember the whole dying and rising, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Um, when, uh, when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Notice the now, not yet. You want me to shut this door? Is it loud? Just notice when the door is shut, it's like shutting the oven door. It, uh, It'll, oh, good. It'll get kind of. It'll get kind of, nice and, nice and warm. Yep. All right. So, so notice the now and not yet concept of this whole idea of the, the this new life in Christ, or that's the Colossians language of chapter three, to use the Romans eight language, the life in the spirit. Verse five is exactly what we were talking about. Before the break with Romans 8, uh, I mean, yeah, Romans chapter 8, 12 and 13. First part of Colossians, now that you are in the realm of the Spirit, this is what it looks like then in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is, is earthy. To use the Romans 8 passage, put to death, therefore, notice the therefore, whatever is of the flesh. And then you have a list of that, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. And then notice why. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. Do any of your versions of the Bible have anything other than disobedient, or do you have some level of a, of a script that gives you some... I'm, I'm in verse 6. Mine just says, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Okay. Um, do you have any like down at the bottom where it gives you like some notes or textual variants or anything? Coming on those who are disobedient. Come, coming on those who are disobedient. All right. So what does your text say, Betty? Do you have a? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, what Paul is getting at in Colossians chapter six is is not just those who are disobedient like one time. This is a full. In, in thought, action, word, constant disobedient, uh, living a lifestyle that is not even open to the work of the Spirit in their life. So that's, just want to give you some, some commentary and clarification there. But the flow of the argument is the same. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, you get where Paul is describing to, uh, to the church at Colossae, they are in Christ. 
to use the Romans 8 language, they're in the realm of the Spirit. Because they're in the realm of the Spirit, we get verse 5 of Colossians chapter 3, which is then to put to death those things that are of the flesh, language of Romans 8. What are they? He gives you just some general terms. Uh, notice in verse 7, these, this is verse 7 of Colossians chapter 3. These are the ways you also once followed. Notice the past tense. When you, to use the Roman 8 language, when you lived in the realm of the flesh, this is what the person did. But they are not in the realm of the flesh, Romans 8 language. Uh, they now are part of Christ. So Paul is acknowledging that. They are, verse 7, these are the ways you once followed when you were living that life, when you were under the flesh. Now, but now, you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self and its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, uh, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the Creator. All right, so it's real important to see this too. Notice that in Colossians 3 verse 7, you still have a lot of past tense, Right? But when you get to uh, verse 9, and you have the idea of don't lie, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed. All right, notice this being renewed is a different verb tense. All right? Um, so you just want to see the interplay with the verbs that describe this idea of what Paul is getting at in Romans 8, which is you are in the realm of the Spirit, which will eventually lead to life. You're in the, in the realm of the Spirit that will eventually lead to life. The big L issue has been satisfied, eternal life. All right? But as we are living this out, there is this, proce this process to the living out uh, of life in the Spirit. We have an obligation. Right. And that obligation, yeah, you do have an obligation, but the way the obligation, the, the obligation takes time, and the way it takes time are the, the lingering effects of the flesh get ticked off. All right, that's my language there, okay? You're not going to find it in Paul's, all right? Um, <laughs> Uh, but that little by little, this work of the Spirit is to purify the believer. And, and so that the nature of the believer or the identity or the way, the way they think and what they say and how they act, doesn't matter what words you use to describe a person, those little by little start to reflect the nature of Christ. Eventually, our nature and Christ's nature will be one and the same. As not just in the big one and the same, but in the way, the way we live out our life, one and the same. But until they start to come together, I mean, or as they're starting to come together, those parts of, those lingering parts of the flesh are ticked off uh, really just one at a time almost. That's the work of the Spirit. So part of the work of the Spirit is not just to take care of the big life issues where uh, who Christ is, what Christ accomplished in death and resurrection is applied big L to the person. They now are no longer in the flesh. They're over here in the realm of the Spirit, which is going to lead to life, eternal life. And at the same time, the work of the Spirit is to purify the believer so that not just big L, but little L life reflects the nature of God. All right? So in Colossians chapter 3, which is a good parallel chapter, you see how this is played out where Paul is writing to a different church other than the church at Rome. Does that make sense? So if you, if you think 8 is a little confusing, just flip over to chapter 3 of Colossians and it might, might be easier. Um, because in, in verse 12, he picks back up on the same thing. That is 12, uh, chapter 3, Colossians 3, 12. 
as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion. So you've got the first part of three. You're in, you're in the realm of the Spirit. What that means is then we're going to put to death all those lingering effects of the flesh. And, and at the same time, we're going to put on those things of the Spirit that will also help us put off those things of the flesh, if that makes sense. Well, what are they? They're kindness, meekness, patience, humility, bear with one another. Uh, if anyone has a complaint against one another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. And then he actually even goes on, on throughout the rest of, of at least to verse 17. So great chapter, uh, chapter 3 of Colossians 1 through 17. But I wanted, to, I wanted you to see the parallelism that exists in Romans 8 and Colossians chapter 3. You know, if someone asked me, uh, do preachers retread their sermons? <laughs> and the, the, the answer is, well, absolutely not. And, uh, but the exegetical work does go from sermon to sermon sometime. And the same thing you see in Romans chapter 8. Uh, Paul's writing the same thing to a different church at a different time. But it's the same theology. All right? So I just wanted to point that out to you. As Yes? Uh, old man as in what, the language old man? As in the, why masculine language? Or, I mean, uh, old, now, uh, so let me address it on two levels. One, I'm going to address the, the masculine language, and I will talk about that for a second, and then we're going to talk about the old man specifically. All right, keep in mind when the Bible was written, it's not the same society as we have today. And so uh, um, whenever it uses the word man, or mankind, it it's, uh, uh, really is more like uh, anthropos, just humanity in general. And so some versions will be very literal, and you get man or mankind. Uh, and some versions of the Bible take into account the, what the author was trying to, to really explain, not just men or man, but people. And so it makes the it makes the jump for us, um, because the society is is I mean it's it's totally uh, it's not the same society that we have today. So when like in um, in in Genesis one uh, verse what twenty three or twenty seven somewhere in that neighborhood where it says, and God created man. That word Adam is man mankind or humanity. All right, so uh, some, some of that is, depending on your version of the Bible, um, is the translation they make it for you into a more of a modern understanding of what the word really means. Uh, now, old man is a term that Paul uses that is juxtaposed to new man or old person to new person. You know, Paul, one of the uh, characteristics of his, of his writing is to uh, set up um, categories or, or uh, juxtapositions between different concepts. And the way he describes, like in Romans, where you've got flesh and then you've got spirit, in other versions of the Bible, he will say, you know, flesh, old man, old way of life, old way of seeing things, acting, what have you, compared to new man or new way of, of seeing life and, and operating, whatever. Old man is ruled by the flesh. Uh, new man is ruled by Christ. So, um, so on one level, the... I just wonder, you know, why? Yeah, part of, part of it is, you know, keep in mind, the Bible is written in a certain time period with certain... I mean, I mean, the, author, the authors of the Bible did not know everything. It's impossible, all right? Um, so even if we have what is... Uh, there are basically three ways that we talk about the Bible in, in forms of uh, inspiration. And, and one of them is that God literally possesses the hand of the person and every word that is written 
is God chose that specific word for a specific purpose. All right? Um, literalists. Another one is that God chooses the person. I'm giving you general terms on this, okay? So um, God chooses the person and through the role of the Spirit influences the person so that the person in their own writing style with their own intellect writes, you know, writes what we have as the Bible, all right? But not, not that God chooses every single word. It's kind of like if I, uh, if I wrote a letter to you or I said, Kathy, would you write a letter to Becky and tell Becky this? All right, it's Kathy's words, my thoughts, or my, you know, everything that goes with that. The third level is that it's the church as a whole under the direction of the Spirit that basically says these, are, these letters are, or are of God and these are not. Because what we have in the Bible that's what we call the canon, there are other letters now, there, there were, boy, there was tons of letters. And uh, some of your versions, uh, uh, um, Apocrypha, any of y'all, your Bibles have the Apocrypha? All right, so that, what that is, that's letters that were popular, but were not canonized. They didn't make the cut, all right? So did they not, you know, and, and the, th those that are, on, say, down here on, on number three, um, is that the church specifically at different times, met together and canonized the Old Testament, said these are the ones of God under, under the direction and the discernment of the Holy Spirit. And, and then at a different time did the same thing with the New Testament. These are the letters of God. Uh, so you have three different ways that the church, big C, historically has, uh, seeks to define how, how, do we, how do we get what we got. And, uh, and that's what we call the canonization of Scripture. Um, and different denominations kind of lean more towards one than the other. I'm not trying to tell you which one, you know, I'm just giving you the, the scope of it, all right? Um, so that's how we, we get what we got. Um, but the, so in any of these, whether it be here, here, or here, is that then old man would be exactly the language that God wanted to use. Old man here would be, you know, the language that the writer uses, and in this case, Paul. And so Paul comes out of a certain culture at a certain time, and in that time, masculine language was used to describe people in general, okay? Um, and so today, if the Bible was being written, it might be old man, or it might be old person, don't know, because this would be something where God chooses the, the exact word. Here, it might be old man slash, well, this is not working. Um, you know, old man slash woman, or person, or, or people, you know, something that's a little more inclusive for what the word means as in its real definition, which is humanity, or person, if that makes sense. And then here, same thing, same thing would apply there. So, I mean, it's a, uh, oh, listen, this is a whole scope of work that you can read. Um, well, because, uh, I mean, it's an important issue because if it's, if it's old man, well, guess what? Y'all didn't make the cut. I mean, you know, uh, I did, you know, so, um, or is it, you know, is it more of man and woman? What's the, what's the word? Uh, so, so it does, it's a good question to ask. And, and what, what the writer is trying to, uh, to convey to the reader, because every, every book is written by an author to a certain audience for a certain purpose. Right? Rome, all right, so Romans, written by Paul to a church, house churches in Rome, for a certain purpose. There's, it's twofold. He wants to visit there. He's got to introduce himself. And he wants to correct their behavior. Well, he doesn't know them. So he's got to figure out a way. How do I, I mean, I, I can't just send an email that says stop it, you know, and then go on to the next one. So, you know, he, he builds the case so that they understand why. So when he actually says in, in chapter 12, live differently, he's, they, they're already with him. Because he's explained the reasons why they are to live differently. 
Well, because they, they're, they Jew Christian, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians are all in the same boat. So if they're all in the same boat, then treat each other as the same. Yeah, it, it is a, it's a, a yeah, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's part of what Paul uh, compares and contrasts with a new before Christ, after or, or before in Christ, now in Christ. Yeah, pre-Christian, post-Christian, or post-conversion, pre-conversion, post-conversion. That would be, you know, that would be some some commentary behind what the old man uh, concept, because it's not just old man that sit that is standalone without a comparison to the new man or to the new person. But what makes one old and what makes one new is not age as in the amount of years. It's what, what they were like, who they were like before Christ, and not just before Christ, historical Christ, you know, ministry, death, and then resurrection, but before Christ in them. Because it, all the, 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 um, in the New Testament, Thessalonians is the first, um, it's in the 50s, 52 A.D. And so that's, that's the, the, the earliest book of the New Testament. Uh, the Gospels even don't come until the 60s. And, uh, and then Paul's writings are from 52 up for, for a number of years. Um, uh, so what they mean by old man is old, what you were like before you were in Christ. New man, what you are like now that you are in Christ. Uh, and it's a, mas- it's a heavy dominated masculine society. And so, so that, that also, you see that not just in the, bi- the biblical, actually, the Bible is an incredibly lib- liberal book. Now, uh, the whole conservative liberal, I see your faces. Some just said, whoa, what do you mean? You know, compared to its time, it is. I, I mean, it's just that you can't, I mean, part of the reasons why the churches got in trouble and they're learning to live with each other, because in a society where it's men at the top, all right, let's just look at how power structures were, were set up inside of, of that society. Overwhelming, overwhelming power set with males. Not just males, but males that were free. All right? Now, if you were a male that was a slave, then you had higher power or, or higher authority than a female that was. But it was uh, the, the male, men, all kinds of other stuff, then women, then children. All right, that's the society. All right, so uh, the fact that one of the first creeds that come out of the New Testament is not the Apostles' Creed. One of the, there's two creeds that come out early on. One of them is the baptismal creed. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Try you in God. You know what the other one is? You want to take a stab at it? This is, oh, we're getting into the deep water here. Doom, 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 doom. No. It's, uh, there's neither uh, male nor female, slave or free, Jew or Greek. All are one in Christ. All right, so think about what that was like at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> when you had a pecking order, all right? Who sits in, I, mean, I don't know how you, our family sits in the same place every time we get together. Whenever we eat as a family. Now, if we're out at a restaurant, maybe not so. But, um, but either at, at, at you know, my house, my mother's house, my brother's homes, uh, it doesn't matter. We sit in, you know, we have a pecking order. <laughs> well, uh, you know, my older brother's the oldest, so he, you know, he, he sits in a certain place, and my mom sits in a certain place, and, and uh, what's that? I sit at the head, man. What you talking about? I'm, I'm right there. Captains, you know. Uh, so, uh, but we have, you know, we have a certain order to this, you know, and, and when we, uh, if my younger brother's hosting, he says the prayer. My older brother's hosting, he says the prayer. You know, if I'm hosting, I mean, we have, a, we have an order to it. I mean, there's an order to, you know, or maybe a dysfunction to our family, who knows. Um, but I would imagine mine's not any different than yours, right? So there's, there was a whole order of structure and authority that, that set uh, inside the, 
the ancient world at that particular time. The fact that Christianity sets a lot of that on its heels, it was a problem. Um, in the Roman church, many of the Roman Christians were slaves who, who were freed. Well, I mean, you know, when Paul uses the word, you're a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. Well, if, you, if that's a part of your history, think about how you would hear that or how you would interpret that. Um, go read the book of Philemon, all right? Onesimus, you know the, the story behind that? Philemon is the landowner, the slave owner. Onesimus was a slave that ran away. He meets Paul later, becomes a Christian. Paul sends him back with his letter. Do you know what the letter says? Receive him like you would receive me. Well, what if you're, I mean, what if you're the, the owner? I mean, could you imagine that? You're sitting, you know, going about your day, and this, I mean, one, it's lost asset, right? Got to have, you know, got to replace it inside that structure. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden, he, he comes rolling up on the horizon carrying a letter. And he's lucky he's not dead in that society, all right? But, I mean, Paul writes this letter, and it's, it's interesting. The first part of the letter is, remember that when I came to you and the message of the gospel that I brought to you and what has happened in your life since. That's Romans 1 through 11. Let me remind you of what Christ has done in your life. Because then you get down to like verse 18 or 13, one of those verses, and he says, oh yeah, by the way, Onesimus... Receive him like you receive me. Which means that he's going to eat at my table. He's going to sleep in my house. I mean, do you see what that's like socially? I mean, so the Bible, if compared to, uh, compared to its history, is incredibly, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's liberal in the sense of what, what it means to be in Christ. I mean, now we're... You know, our society, I mean, what happens if we, you know, if you just use masculine language everywhere you go? I mean, it might work a little bit in the South, but when you get outside the South, it's not going to work. And it might not even work in the South because it's offensive, right? Y'all don't have any rights, you know? Y'all want to know, just call me, you know? You didn't make the cut. I mean, so, you know, there'd be, there's no way in the world we would do that. And, and so, uh, um, so, but comp Compared to its time, it, it is, uh, well, the book of Judges, the Sunday sermon was on Gideon. Gideon comes after who? Who was one of the, who was the real, there's two heavyweight judges. Yeah, bingo. Deborah's not a man. And the men uh, will seek Deborah's advice, and some of them won't go unless, they, unless she goes with them. She's a warrior judge, which means they won't even go into battle unless she straps up and goes, puts on her sword. But now once she's there, they all just go and, you know, like it's no big deal. But they, I mean, he, even the, even the so-called generals won't move without Deborah. And there's a part, and we're going to talk about this in, in coming up uh, as in this uh, big thing, one faith, uh, uh, big faith, one thing, is uh, she even tells them, now look, if I go, they're going to remember me. They're not going to remember you. And you know what they say? Strap up. We're not going without you. And it says that she ruled for 80 years. Now, I mean, that's a, maybe not 80, but I mean, it's the, it's the idea that it's not just, it's 40 times 2. Well, what's 40? 40, 3, 7, 40, sometimes literal, sometimes figurative uh, in the Bible. So whatever is a complete period of time, she has it twice. Well, I mean, you know, if you're... If you're in that day and time, oh my gosh, you know, that's pretty progressive, isn't it? They're highlighting a woman. Inside the Old Testament, there were times where women could own and pass down property. That's not as much as with men. But the fact that it's mentioned compared to, compared to their time frame is, that's fairly progressive. 
I mean, just it is what it is. And so when you get in the New Testament and then you say, well, you know, if you're in Christ, it really doesn't matter about your history. You, you know, top or bottom, male or female, does not matter because in Christ we're all one. Well, I mean, that sounds good for us today. But back then, you know, there was a reason why Paul and them were beaten and, you know, drug, uh, drag them out of the house and, and, and uh, leave them for dead is because they were messing up the society, disrupting it. So that's interesting. I mean, it's, it's uh, so if, I mean, the Bible is, uh, you, you remember, I mean, I'm just like really off the text, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I th you know, we were doing so good. We have just three more verses, and then we'd, the whole thing I wanted to do would be it. I mean, you know, so um, remember that, that series that came out on the History Channel, the Bible, or whatever? It was like a couple of years ago, you know, had these uh, from top to bottom. And, uh, um, you know, they had to tone it down because if, if the Bible was actually put on the screen, it'd be rated X. Double X or whatever, what's more past X? Double X or triple X? I mean, it'd be whatever the, you know, 26 of them. I mean, you know, whatever. I mean, it's, uh, well, just because you read it and there's, I mean, there, there are just murders and, and rapes and annihilations and, I mean, just people just destroying each other and, uh, you know, just all types of dysfunction. There's no way in the world they could show the Bible and, and, and really what it says on TV. I mean, we, people wouldn't stand for it. I mean, it probably would. I mean, you know, uh, it'd be, uh, you know, uh, who knows? I'm not sure. I'm not up to, I don't, I'm not up to date on all the, the movies, but um, it definitely would be on Netflix and Amazon, let me tell you. I mean, you know, so. All right, so uh, anyway, real quick, just because I know that y'all are waiting, and I don't want you to leave and go to lunch and just have a big emptiness in your stomach. Uh, 14, Romans 8, 14 uh, through 17. Uh all right, so we got this idea of so then, and verse 12, we're, we're not going to live according to the flesh. In verse 14, this is the payoff, all right? So this is a little bit of a transition piece. Um, for all who are led by the Spirit of God, notice the four, so it's connecting back to don't live in the flesh. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Now, does some of your versions have children of God? What do you got? Sons, Sons that's right. Right, well, look at you, Bitsy. Did you write that in there? I mean, uh, you sure? Well, that's interesting. Sons and daughters. Now, mine says children, all right? So, but, you know, it, the literal is sons, all right? For you did not receive, but sons as in children, all right? This masculine language here. Uh, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received a spirit of what? Sonship. Well, does anybody have adoption? Yep. All right. So, well, Bitsy, you definitely get an A for today, man. Look at you. So, uh, uh, when we cry, what? Uh, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are either sons, children, or sons and daughters of God. And if sons or sons and daughters or children, then heirs. So notice that we're we're really leaving the description of a child into something more. Heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. In fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Two things real quick. The payoff for the reason why the spirit leads the life is because people are adopted. And even in the ancient world, adopted people or children could share in the same inheritance as biological children. All right, so, and that's why you get at the end of the passage, child of God, then really heir, and not just heir, co-heir, joint heirs with Christ himself. Um, and notice that it, it creates a, uh, that when Paul describes what it really means to be adopted, is look at the way the adopted child addresses the father that's not their biological father. Abba, which is a term of intimacy. It's not, that's not father. That's like daddy, papa, I mean, that type of stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an intimacy, it's uh, an intimate title. And notice that it's also the same way that who addresses the father in a prayer. Jesus. Lord, teach us how to pray. 
All right? Let me tell you how to pray then. Start this way. Abba. Abba, Father. We say Heavenly Father. That's poor translation. All right? So, but that's, so you can see the connection there. So the payoff for, for how the Spirit, life in the Spirit, realm of the Spirit, leads to life, big L and little L, is because one of the works of the Spirit is, uh, uh, is that it, it, it adopts us into God's family with full rights. So you could even address God as full son, full daughter, full child because the Spirit has placed you there. And notice that uh, it's, it's an act of God, not an act of the child or the person. Adoption is an act of the parent, not an action of the child. All right, so now that you're completed and full and good to go, this looks like a wonderful time to end. So uh, go in peace. May the Lord be with you. Amen.